Has the impossible become possible? No, not yet, for everyone. A tree grows without making any noise about it. That's our culture, our mentality. And we're working year in, year out for you and your city. Cities for life, cities against the death penalty. Un saluto a tutti. Greetings to all from Rome and from the community of Sant'Egidio. Today is World Cities for Life Day. At present, as we know, more than half of the world lives in cities. And there are governments who still tell the story to their citizens that the death penalty is necessary for a safer world. But this is a very old, extra old fake news. For centuries, they also said that <laughs> that the earth was not uh, was flat this is fake so more than ever we say stop and death do not kill not in our name stop killing using the world the word justice because the death penalty does not heal anyone from pain only creates other death <laughs> but we as our hashtag stand for humanity, we stand up, we fight, we stand for justice, we resist for the humanity and we cry there is no justice without life. Why are we so many of us together in 2,440 cities around the world? Oh, this is a, the breaking news. This was this morning. Now we are already 2,455 cities. It, we are here because it is necessary. This thousand-year-old pandemic called the death penalty is becoming to wear off. In 1976, only 16 states in the world had abolished the death penalty. Today, 144 countries do not no longer use it, whether abolished by law or de facto in the past years. Only 18 countries around the world carried ex out executions in, 19, in 2019. There were 20 countries in the last five years. Recorded executions has fallen from more than 1,500 to less than 500. These are good news. Abolitions ongoing. A uh, short list, Mongolia, Guinea, Guatemala in 2017, Burkina Faso in 2018. State of Colorado, Sierra Leone in 2020, Chad, and the state of Virginia close to Washington in 2021, while Gambia, Malaysia, California, Pennsylvania, and Oregon states declared a public moratorium. Also, Kazakhstan, Angola, and Armenia did something that seems difficult, but it's easy to understand. They ratified the second optional protocol on civil and political rights which commits states in a binding way to abolish the death penalty. This is impressive. This is progress. This is why I say that this uh, thousand-year-old pandemic called the death penalty is wearing out. It is 20 years. Since the world movement of Cities for Life was born, there were only 58 cities at the outset, united with Rome, gathered around the Colosseum. Today, as I said, more than 2,000 more. 
So why? Why are we here? Because today the word life is even more necessary. COVID-19 continues to harm many people. We need to help Africa and the global south on making progress on vaccines, but also the north of the world. We know that many, too many irresponsible men and women are playing with their own lives and the lives of the others. This is why today we are living this great worldwide web event as a global embrace that goes from Manila to Santiago de Chile, from Buenos Aires to New York, from Abidjan to Rome, from Bologna, from Firenze, appeal to Ohio, from the mayor Nardella. But in Italy, more than 1,000 cities are experiencing this event in this very moment. So an embrace for all those who are fighting for life, standing by the dignity of life and the dignity of the life of others. In many ways, from Brussels is with us the president of the European Parliament, David Sassoli. Thank you for being with us. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Thank you for invitation. I wish to greet, first of all, the friends of the community of Sant'Egidio, my friend Mario Marazziti, the speakers, and all those who are participating in this initiative. This year is the 20th anniversary of the Global Cities for Life Day, an important campaign against the death penalty, in which thousands of cities all over the world participate every year. This great initiative, which is celebrated every year, is on 30 November, the day in which the Grand Duke of Tuscany became the first in the world to formally abolish capital punishment and the practice of torture is an opportunity to reflect on our common values. For us, this represents a moral duty and a cultural commitment that cannot be set aside because history teaches us that this punishment does not actually deter crime. In fact, executions represent a failure of the rule of law because they are irrevocable and so, as often happen, can be eventually inflicted on innocent people. It is an unacceptable practice that undermines the value of life, which is the indispensable prerequisite for promoting civil coexistence, social relations, and relations between states. The European institutions, and in particular the European Parliament, have always been at the forefront in opposing this practice, which is still used all too often because we uphold the dignity of the person. We believe in the legal recognition of his or her value. We should not stay indifferent in we cannot stay indifferent, and above all, there can be no justice without the full respect for human rights. We need to act, involve citizens, and be committed so that the right to life is protected and at the same time valued in every corner of the world. For all these reasons, I would like to thank once again the community of Sant'Egidio for promoting this initiative and, above all, for helping to foster a culture of dialogue and reconciliation between people and humankind at large. I thank you once again for your invitation. I hope, of course, to meet you as soon as possible and have the opportunity to meet. Good work. We cannot say indifferent. Thank you. Thank you for these words. Speaker Sassoli, these are very important uh, initiatives. And you, uh, your work has long been helping strengthen European Union's path towards unity and develop human rights policies. And this is helping other members of the European Union and the European Parliament to resist to national uh, interests uh, which are short-sighted and and so you are strengthening our work with your endeavors we are perhaps not aware completely aware of this acceleration of history we are undergoing perhaps we can understand this by reflecting on the resolution for the universal monitorium approved at the UN General Assembly in 2007, after two decades of failed attempts, also through 
initiatives pushed by Italy and Europe, but those attempts were not unsuccessful for 20 years. Then in 2007, the breakthrough. We are proud for having participated to that push and the number of countries in favor 104 and those who are against the resolution are were 54. Now the those who are in favor of the moratorium are 123 and the, those who are contrary to the moratorium are 38. This is an acceleration of history because an ethical standard for justice have been set and it is increasingly embarrassing to make use of the death penalty if we if we think about this and this is helping the, the world that uh, to understand this is a published shame for governments and the life of uh, those who are uh, guilty ones cannot be taken away otherwise because we cannot never accept to be like those who create new victims no guilt can be irreparable or especially when justice is so imperfect. As Pope Francis strongly reminded the world in unequivocal words as the Ten Commandments, when he said, I quote, the death penalty is always unacceptable because it undermines the sacred dignity of the human person, unquote. But this is not a linear path. While there has been a significant drop in executions in the last two years in Iraq or Saudi Arabia, which were leaders of the countries who were, were in love with the death penalty, they unfortunately tripled in Egypt. So to better understand what we can do in the that part of the world, we asked to to, have, to be with us, Tawakal Karman, a courageous woman, famous journalist, founder of the Women Journalists Without Chains movement, well known in Yemen as the mother of the revolution. And she's a young mother. She is the Nobel Peace Laureate, Tawakal Karman. Thank you for being with us. What? Wait a minute, sorry for that. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my thanks to community of San Diego uh, and my appreciation for their uh, efforts uh, that seek to stop the uh, death penalty. Um, as you know, the world has uh, witnessed throughout history unjust uh, policies and oppressive and brutal um, uh, practices against those with dissenting, you know, opinions. Everyone, including even those introducing themselves as uh, spokespeople for the religion, got involved in this game, the game of uh, blood. Um, uh, for my uh, personally, um, uh, I um, I am against uh, this penalty in general. But I also know that the death penalty topic is so complicated that needs lengthy discussions. But what I believe that the death penalties in general should be at least reviewed and monitored constantly to avoid any deviations. And let me here, I want to focus on the death penalty as a weapon of Terence, uh, this penalty have been the most deadly and favorite weapons of tyrants. Our duty today is to do our best and work as hard as possible to stop this penalty across the world. In, in today's world, defined as the era of human rights, we have no choice but to move forward in this direction for several cons uh, uh, considerations, including that, as I said, some authoritarian regimes often use death penalties as a weapons of revenge and not as a means to achieve justice, in addition to the fact that justice and security system 
suffers from uh, some weakness and imbalances. If this is the case, then it is only fair, at least, at least to suspend the death penalty in these uh, countries. I cannot accept that a person is sentenced to death under an unfair justice system and in an aggressive political environment. Without, you know, hesitation, I agreed, you know, uh, uh, months ago uh, to participate in campaign to stop the death penalty in Egypt. Likewise, I am always ready to take part in any campaign aimed to stop death penalty anywhere. Because the stopping death penalties misused by dictatorial regimes is among the most honorable things one can ever do in his life or in her life. Life is a gift from God, and no one should think that they are able uh, to take it away. The Egyptian military coup and its government has executed innocent people for political reasons. Victims were subjugated to mock trials lacking in impartiality and some of which took place in a comic manner. Similarly, Saudi Arabia and Iran used death penalties as a weapon against their opponents just to make you know, the principle of deterrence work. It is deeply regrettable that justice is violated and not taken into account. Several weeks ago, the Houthi militia in Yemen carried out the death penalty against 10 people, allegedly involved in the killing of one of its senior leaders, despite the fact that this person was killed in an airstrike of the Saudi Emirati coalition. The Houthi militia conducted a secret trial that lacked the most basic rules of due process. Their executions were carried out in the prisons in the prisons of large crowds and some of the militia's leaders. Following the execution of the death sentences, um, the, milita- the militia men performed folk dances. All this was filmed and shared on media outlets, including social media. Do you think that these executions were aimed at achieving justice as they claim, or spreading terror in the heart of people. What happened was a show of barbaric strength and brutality. A thing that mirrors, you know, the militia's raging thirst for power. Unfortunately, this militia is planning to carry out new executions. Obviously, all these executions were intended not to achieve justice, but to subject the people for political purposes. Steps must be taken to strengthen global efforts to stop death penalties and push towards a relevant international body. And the United Nations should also play a greater role to achieve this end. Finally, I would like to point out that our effort to stop the death penalty are intended not to side with killers, nor to sympathize with the criminals. Those killers should face justice, but it's important that we should force tyrant around the world to stop using this penalty as a weapons against their opponents. Thank you so much. Grazie davvero, grazie davvero, signora Carman. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Carman. Madame, you are right. The death penalty is actually spurs the worst in our cells, and and it, it is this is a new another another reason to 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 make without. 
But there is another continent, like Africa, has resolutely embarked on the road to justice without the death penalty. 20 years ago, only 11 African countries had abolished the death penalty. Today, the figure has more than doubled to 23, actually, and another 20 African countries are de facto abolitionists. So the number of countries applying death penalty have fallen to 10. In our, these days in Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire, the steering committee of the World Commission Against Death Penalty is gathered. Just now, I remember this coalition. I, when I, I love the coalition. Sant'Egidio cherishes this coalition. It was 13 May 2002 when it was born here in Rome, in Sant'Egidio. And we were only 23 organizations, founder organizations. We were in the Peace Hall, where 10 years before we had the signature of the Peace Accord for Mozambique. Now, the membership of this World Coalition is has risen up to 150 organizations. So with us, we have a, a contact with uh, with Abidjan, with Aurélie Placé. Aurélie is the director of the World Coalition Against Death Penalty. She's a, she's a tenacious uh, and a solar person. She's, uh, she helps the, uh, the World Coalition to support all other organizations, even the small ones, to Aureli, please give me the floor. How is the meeting now? Aureli, please tell us. We hope to hear you. Because we would like to hear some words coming directly from Abidjan. Let's try to hear Orly's witness from Abidjan. We try again. We will we will try to contact you later, even live. We will we will try again later on. But while we wait for Aurélie. We would like to say that in Africa, there was a case in point, a recent case in point, was the abolition of the death penalty in Burkina Faso in 2018. And that was uh, strongly supported by the Minister of Justice, René Bagoro. And it was, in a way, created uh, an, in, an incubator for the exchange of best practices between ministers of justice, a new format which was developed in the past years where ministers of justice of countries who are still retentionists, together with ministers of countries of countries who already abolished the death penalty, exchange best practices and this bear fruits. This had happened already for the abolition in Mongolia synergizing with other countries. And this happened also with Burkina Faso and with René Bagore, who... René, be with us. By Meanwhile, the voice of Aurélie came from Abidjan. Aurélie. Uh, Here today, I have a request to abolish the death penalty. We are also here today with you to decline the death penalty. Beh, diciamo, ci fanno gli auguri e noi ci. They are wishing us well. We thank them, and we are also supportive to their work for the battles they are engaging in Africa. Now we have Bagoro from Burkina Faso. The death penalty was abolished in Burkina Faso with the adoption of the new penal code in 2018. 
was a result of a long process strongly supported by political will at the highest level of the state. The abolition of death penalty rested on four conditions as it certainly does for most abolitionist countries. First, the restorative role of justice and therefore of punishment. Then the purpose of punishment which must have as its subjective the rehabilitation of the condemned person. Third, the rejection of state violence. Finally, uh, stating the inhuman character of the death penalty, which is regarded as an offense against human rights, we have therefore abolished the death penalty in Burkina Faso, as many countries have done. But there are still many countries that have not yet done so or are on the verge of doing so. We must therefore continue the fight. Struggle to help these countries achieve the abolition of death penalty. But at the same time, we must stay vigilant, especially in abolitionist countries, because the realities of a return, of backtracking, is, are always there in many countries. This is a risk also in our country, Burkina Faso, where we are confronted with terrorism. But we must maintain the hope of one day achieving a world free from death penalty. These are encouraging words. Thank you. Thank you. And we commend Burkina Faso on the tremendous work with your country. Also with the Bravo program for birth registration, providing invisible children a new identity and restoring a fundamental human rights, uh, the right to exist for mo more than 4 million new citizens. Much is happening in the world. Let's try to understand together. Innocents who were condemned and then exonerated in the US. Exonerated with, by DNA for serious crimes, 192 upon 232. 232 innocents in 20 years. 27 years average illegal detention. Two culprits identified 81 upon 232 innocents exonerated. False confessions, failed analysis, misidentification of eyewitnesses. Executions in the U.S. since 1976. The world is changing. We have a reduction of retentionist countries. In death row, 32,994 people. More than 5,000 received letters. So no. These figures speak for themselves. Thousands of years spent by innocents in death row, on death row. And these, at least one in 15 of all the cases dealt with by the Innocence Project in the U.S. show that one in 15 is completely innocent. When there is a confession and also eyewitnesses, we think that it is impossible to make a mistake. Yet, the innocent people on death row eight times out of ten were condemned only on the basis of confessions or eyewitnesses, fake or mistaken. This is horrible. This could happen to each one of us. The historical map of lynchings in southeastern UN 
uh, United States is also impressive because it overlaps the map of formal executions. Time goes by, but lynchings and executions are overlapping. The same places, racism, torture, executions are related, are relatives. Executions are always a proof of impotence, of weakness, not of strength, of fear, not of courage. Executions always are independent from uh, armed assaults. We always have to remind ourselves that death penalty is an armed shortcut vis-à-vis -vis social problems that are far from being solved, like drug trafficking. And death rows are full of innocent people or people stuck in the most degrading way those places, a no man's land where no one can monitor, well, we're in a way, we're visited through letters with the Committee of Sant'Egidio, letters that change and continues to change the lives of many. Let's listen about these letters. Letter from Rex Mais to Secondo, a friend from Turin, I read, I'm sure that you will understand this is a moment of insecurity. I am moved. Perhaps you will read these words when I will not be able anymore to read your letter. I will be gone. This is not a long letter, but I will tell you a story an ancient story, a story of perhaps was told by other peoples, but it comes from the American Native, Native American Indians. A man was walking on the seashore at dawn and he noticed an old man who was far away and it seemed that the old man was dancing, he was going in front, entering the sea, bending, then coming back, two steps towards the sea, then he came back. It was like a strange dance, and he repeated this movement back and forth from the sea. And the young man was went reached the old man, and looking closer, he saw that the old man was not actually dancing, but he was taking a starfish the starfish from the sand and threw them back into the sea. So he was curious. The young man stopped beside the old man and said, why are you doing this? And the old man answered, the starfish is lost, will die on the scorching, under the scorching sun on the sand, said the old man. But the seashore is long thousands of miles. There are millions of starfish everywhere, said the young man, laughing at him. For a moment, the old man looked at the starfish he had in his hands and then put it gently into the water. And he said, I do this for her, because for her, this is making the difference. So you will ask me why an old strange guy like me uh, tells you a story of a starfish, but this story is all about our friendship. Life is the seashore. There are millions of people in Italy, and those are the miles of the seashore, and there are thousands of prisoners on death row in the U.S. We are the starfish who were lost, who were stranded, starfishes. Millions of people do not have influence in my life, but you, my dear friend, you are unknown by thousands of other prisoners here in death row. But the most important is, my dear Secondo, as the old man of the story, I told you, collecting that stranded starfish on the sand, that you made the difference. You made a difference in my life. 
your friendship. Put me back into the sea after I, I was stranded. You were the great difference in my life. You were so important for this starfish of me. My life is better now, has improved, because I have known you. Thank you, Fabrizio Gifuni, Italian actor. He will help us to understand the intensity of this story. We now would like to listen to Antoinette Shaheen, Lebanese woman unjustly accused 22 years ago of a murder she did not commit. She was tortured during her imprisonment. She was condemned to death. Now she's a free woman. Her, wound, her wounds are actually her strength at the service of the others. Antoinette. My name is Antoinette Shain. I was born in Lebanon on 26 June 1971. The last of a family of eight children. It was a beautiful mess, my family. We lived in Harabid, a coastal village like there are dozens in Lebanon, about 50 kilometers north of Beirut. The sea was our playground, and my father was a fisherman. But the war soon came, and my life was connected to war and was uh, the difficulties of my country were in me. And soon the tanks of Syrian Palestinian commando arrived. Harabida was invited, the fighting, the attacks, the death. We were all in danger of being killed. My family then moved to another village. We ended up living in a very small house. The younger men left and chose militancy. My younger brothers joined them. My brother Jean joined the militias of Lebanese forces. I was arrested on 21 March 1993 because my brother Jean was a member of the Lebanese forces. I was 20 years old, and that day the police entering my house knocked down the statue of Our Lady, breaking it. After refusing to sign, there was an accomplice to an assassination. It was my mother who announced me the verdict of a death sentence. That moment was too hard for me, also for my mother. Well, I lived terrible moments. I was tortured. I suffered every kind of torture, even that of thirst. I could never see the sun, nor could I feel the fresh air on my face. For five and a half years, I dreamed of being able to hug my mother again. The only contact I had was through letters. The hardest thing in prison is actually loneliness, isolation. Every second in prison is a pain that only those who live it can describe. When I heard about the death sentence verdict, I fainted. I had faith in justice. I was sure they would declare my innocence. But then I had been sentenced to death. I fainted, and for a month I could no longer speak or walk. Fear woke me up every morning. In 1997, Amnesty International made an intervention in my case. I started receiving thousands of letters every day from all over the world. They were the light in my cell. On 24 June 1999, the last trial, I was finally declared innocent and I was released. Life began again. But how to resume living in 99? I was found innocent. But after what? I had lost five and a half years. I didn't know what to do in my life. With this freedom, I was no longer used to. No one would give me orders anymore, pace my day with obligations. I wanted to start studying again and also to do something against the death penalty, especially to help my fellow prisoners. Since the day of my release, I've been working, struggling for the abolition of death penalty. I want to affirm with the testimony of my life that death penalty must be abolished. It must be abolished. There are continuous mis mistakes of justice. The story of Antoinette Shaheen, myself, is the example of these mistakes. I lived between war and prison after prison. I built my own family. I have two children, but I feel a duty, a duty towards all prisoners and those sentenced to death. No one has the right to take away life because life is sacred and also feel 
a duty towards my country, Lebanon, my country, land, land of Cedar's model of freedom and coexistence, still suffering from violence and poverty. I dream peace for my country. Today we don't talk about Lebanon anymore because we don't know what to do with Lebanon, a country that welcomes refugees. This is why I work together with the associations in Lebanon, in France, in Santa Gidio, in the whole world to affirm that the state cannot, must not condemn to death. I'm happy to be here with the Committee of Santa Gidio. I thank you, and thanks to you, I can continue to be a militant. I can support cities for life, like in 2014 when I came in Rome at the Colosseum together. Let us continue the fight, the struggle for the abolition of death penalty and torture. Thank you. We feel united to Lebanon to this story, but we are also siding this country for the courage it, it has. Two million refugees hosted in a small country of four or five million people. This is why we are all, all Lebanese tonight. But some people said in, in death row, more than, more than five years, but for 21 years in prison, Curtis McCarthy was then freed by the DNA proof. Let's try to close our eyes. Let's try to put ourselves in the shoes of those who, in 21 years in the prison cell in the death row, stand it as innocent. Curtis, you have the floor. Leave me alone. My own psychosis got bad enough. I invented this woman in my head, the archetype. No clear face, just a woman. And that's what motivated me. Not to give up every day. Curtis, don't do this to me. Don't come home a wreck. Get off that bed and exercise. Get up. Don't give up. Don't lose your man. to me all person. If you come home to me a wreck, you'll ruin my life too. Be a man, stay strong. Get up. And I do it. Get up and exercise. Move around. Something so simple could feel that good. And how badly I had missed. Simple human contact. I 
keep that in mind now when I don't feel good and I'm having a bad day. Simple pleasures. Things we lose sight of when we're busy trying to pay the bills. And complaining because we don't have a good internet connection. Stupid shit. It doesn't mean anything. We're alive. What more could you ask for? We are alive. It is a privilege. What can we ask more? We say this also. We receive from Atlafin a relative of a victim who joined us, encourages us to continue the struggle to eliminate death and a, a suffering for the families of the victims and the families of the those on death row and there is a chorus via internet also the Metropolite Seraphim Kikotis from the Orthodox Church he is participating to this event of ours and fight together with us stand by us against the death penalty. Worldwide, there are at least 8 million and a half, 8.59 million convicted prisoners. Also, half of them are in the US, in China and Russia alone. Uh, allow me to now refer as prisons, the homes for the elderly, which uh, where visits visitors were not possible, but banned visitors, but not COVID. There is a enormous number of victims from COVID. We do not want to forget the pandemic victims. Let us go now to Asia. Asia, home to the third of world's death row inmates. We do not have statistics on China, North Korea, or Vietnam. But observers agree that having reduced, for example, in China, the power of peripheral courts on capital crimes and trials has reduced executions in China by at least 30%. Year 2020 was a special year for death penalty in Asia. Uh, 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 nearly a total moratorium. The number of known executions in countries of billions of people were seven. Seven is a low figure. Four in India after death of moratorium, two in Bangladesh, but where we have all, almost 2,000 sentenced to death, and one in Taiwan, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Afghanistan last year did not carry out death sentences last year, did not execute inmates. In Singapore, there is one pending. Unfortunately, during Pope Francis's visit to Japan as San Degidio, we had asked for an Olympic truce. Well, we could say that year 2020, even without the Olympics, mar marked a year of truce, which had not been there for 20 years. We are grateful for this. That was Japan. Now, two executions were... Uh, were stopped. Now let us listen to two powerful witnesses from Asia, one from Malaysia and one from Indonesia. Susanna Norlihan is a tenacious woman, an internationally renowned lawyer who dedicates her life to stopping capital punishment, and not only in Malaysia, together with the friends of Akpan, the great Asian organization that linking humanitarian organizations in that continent. I remember when it started in Hong Kong, and I'm so glad for having participated to that founding moment, Susanna Norlihan. Uh, 
You have the floor. Susanna. Microphone, Susanna. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Mr. Mario. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to say uh, thank you to Santa Gidio uh, for inviting me uh, to be a speaker in this webinar and to participate once again in this important event, uh, Cities for Life. Uh, I would also like to express my gratitude to Santa Gidio and as well as uh, Malaysian at Penn for always supporting me. Um, well, uh, I get to know um, them when I first attended the 7th uh, World Congress uh, Against the Death Penalty held in Brazil in 2019. Uh, as requested by the organizer, I will share with you today uh, the story of my client uh, whose death sentence was set aside uh, by the federal court that is the highest court in Malaysia on November 1st this year. Uh, my client is a man uh, named Rosman Ben Ibrahim. Um, when he was arrested um, uh, on uh, November 12, 2013, he was a, a very young man. Um, if I'm not mistaken, on his uh, early, uh, sorry, in his middle 20s, and has been charged in the Malaysian High Court uh, with two uh, with two uh, drug trafficking offences. Uh, both cases were related to each other. Uh, but unfortunately were tried uh, separately before different judges and I was the counsel defending him in both trials. Uh, for the first offence, he was accused of trafficking 1,197.68 grams of cannabis which was found in a house. Uh, however, at the end of the prosecution case, uh, he was acquitted and discharged without having to defend himself. For that, I was uh, grateful for our success. Uh, as for the second case, uh, he was charged with trafficking uh, 4,754 grams of cannabis, which involved an agent provocator or a policeman uh, pretending to be a buyer. Uh, unfortunately, in that case, uh, he was ordered to enter his defence and was found guilty at the end of the trial and thus uh, sentenced to death. Uh, right after he was convicted, I filed an appeal to the Court of Appeal as part of my duty towards him. Uh, however, uh, I advised him to appoint another lawyer because at that time, I believe I had failed to defend him in that case. Uh, he accepted my advice, even though later, uh, the Court of Appeal appointed a defense lawyer for him because his family couldn't afford to pay a new lawyer. And sadly, uh, he lost uh, that appeal. Then his father, who was an old man, uh, contacted me and persuaded me to handle his appeal in the federal court. I remember he said, uh, please, Susanna, um, this is going to be his last opportunity, his last appeal. Then I had no choice but to agree. Uh, I had to take over the matter from another lawyer who had already uh, been appointed by the federal court to represent him since he was too poor to pay any legal fees. So on appeal, uh, I argued that during the trial, the prosecution failed to guide the court and the defense at the earliest opportunity as to which option the prosecution sought to pursue in proving the case against my client, namely whether to prove the case based on direct evidence or by uh, invoking the presumption of possession or presumption of trafficking. Failure to do so has caused a miscarriage of justice towards my client because there was no assistance at all uh, for the judge to focus on the relevant evidence and for the defense to direct the cross-examination on the material points. Uh, I further argued that the prosecution's opening statement only referred to the arrangement made between my clients and the agent provocator for the sale of the drugs. To make things worse, they made confused submissions at the end of the prosecution case as well as at the, at the end of the trial. Uh, hence, that was one of the reasons I put forward as to why the High Court judge made a confused judgment when convicting and sentencing my client to death. The miscarriage of justice towards my client was further pronounced when the judge himself failed to make a clear and proper finding and oral instruction on whether my client should raise a reasonable doubt or rebut the presumptions of possession or presumption of trafficking 
when he ordered my client to enter his defense. The judge also made, made a confused judgment at the end of the trial that made it impossible for my client's conviction to stand. I also argued about the credibility of the agent provocator and that there was no prearranged plan for my client to sell the drugs to him. It was all a lie and my arguments were supported by the exhibits exhibited in court by the prosecution. Um, in the exhibits, uh, it shows that there was, uh, it was... Um, La prigione. Uh, yeah, sorry? Uh, 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 in the exhibits, uh, it was, uh, it shows that uh, there was a, a, a telephone um, bills and um, the uh, uh, agent provocator said that he contacted my clients to buy the, uh, the drugs. But in the um, telephone bills, there was no such proof to that um, effect. So I argued that the decision of the Court of Appeal regarding the overwhelming evidence of his having prearranged a plan to sell the drug was incorrect because the court fail to evaluate and appreciate the evidence properly. Uh, under Article 5 of, uh, sorry, under Article 5, uh, Subsection 1 of the Malaysian Federal Constitution, my client has the right to a fair trial. But based on what happened during the trial in the High Court, he was not given that right. In fact, the trial was an unfair one. To my surprise, the panel of the Federal Court, consisting of three judges, unanimously agreed with my arguments. However, uh, since my client was arrested with the drugs and the defense of an innocent carrier was rejected by them, they found my client guilty of drug possession only. They have set aside the death sentence and substituted it with 18 years of imprisonment and 10 strokes of whipping. Uh, although I fail uh, uh, totally to acquit and discharge my client in that case, I believe I have saved him from the death sentence. I hope this story will motivate other people who think that there is no more hope uh, uh, of saving the lives of those on death row. Hope is always our weapon, our strength, and keeps us fighting to abolish the death penalty. To all my fellow lawyers, no matter where you are, this is what I learned for the, tw for the past 20 years in practice, that no matter how bad a case is, if you search deeply and work harder to find any mistakes or doubts in it, um, inshallah, you will be successful. Never give up because you are the only hope for those on death row. Uh, and lastly, please remember, there will be no justice in a miscarriage of justice. And finally, no justice without life. Thank you. Non può esserci giustizia. No justice without a uh, fair trial. No justice without life. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. The fight against death penalty is made up of many legal battles, those who you, you managed to win. Joining us from another great country in the world, Indonesia, is Bishop Vitus Subiante, Bishop of Padang, who is rector of the Akara University in Jakarta, in Indonesia. The majority of death sentences are issued. More than 80 percent are because of uh, um, uh, drug trafficking. But there is still work being done also by the Muslim Association. I give you the floor. First of all, I would like to thank the Committee of Santa Gidio for having invited me to participate to this important meeting for a world without death penalty. There is no justice without life. I strongly agree with this. Um, in Indonesia, we, we have death penalty, and notwithstanding the contestation of many, many civil situations, the, the administration of President Jokowi, the death penalty was applied for drug trafficking. And death penalty is a practice in Indonesia, notwithstanding the no moratorium or, which is applied in our country's drug crimes are in fact influencing decisions of death penalty in Indonesia. And from 2004 to 2021, in 70 years, 320 sentences to death were issued. Since the, f the year 2000, 
Santegidio in Indonesia struggles for the abolition of death penalty in Indonesia. For example, the case of racial violence in Poso, in Sulawesi, and involved Fabiano Stibu, Domingos da Silva, and Marinos Riwa as the first uh, condemned to death. And this was uh, quite uh, contentious. And um, that brought the Committee of Sant'Egidio to try to free and, uh, those who were sentenced to death. The committee accompanying them, sending letters to them in sign of French. In 2015, Sant'Egidio made a, a stand to stop the execution of 10 people in death row, uh, among which Mary Jane Veloso. This action was also um, in many countries, in many towns like Jakarta, Jakarta, Kubang. And this action began to asking a request of pardon to Mr. Widodo, the seventh president of the Republic of Indonesia. And in demonstration of candles and prayer and rallies, just an example. In 2019, Sant'Egidio also uh, followed the, the trial of Julian Ho, a Chinese citizen who was drug trafficking in Bali. He was finally condemned to 20 years of prison. Sant'Egidio wrote letters and uh, sent him clothes and material. Julian was, of course, had a in economic was in a dire situation, and he was uh, fell in the trap of accepting uh, to be um, a drug trafficker, and uh, well, but he did not know that the drugs were in his bag, and that is similar to the the issues of Mary Jane in 2015 in Jakarta. At present, Santegidio is supporting another condemned to death, Gaudesius Resing, who was, who is in the Kupang prison for a um, case of murder in 2002 in Sica, Flores. The Committee of Santigio met him in, in August 2018 in a visit and be, made friends with him. He was condemned to death. He is on death row. He's still fighting to obtain uh, parole. During pandemic of COVID-19, there were 129 people condemned to death, and 18 were actually executed. According to Amnesty International, the condemnation to death in Indonesia in 2020 were 170 cases, but so in total, 482 people risk to be executed. The pandemic of COVID-19 uh, spurred economic problems and, of course, uh, criminal minds also took advantage, like, for example, uh, those who traffic in drugs. But death penalty is a trial that should be strongly reinforced by legal um, ring fence with legal uh, rights. During pandemics, the, the legal service will not uh, well functioning, so trials and putting people on death row should be avoided because justice was not functioning properly. For example, tr online trials through video conference maybe are not the best way to reveal truth in, in criminal cases. And there are many problems in those criminal courts online. For example, there are virtual proofs that can be manipulated and reduce the objective judgment of judges. So online trials are not effective, and in applying death penalty should be done very carefully. And I would say that the online trials also have an impact on the legal counsel, which is so scarce, and few translations are available. The law used to date is the colonial heritage from 1915. It was applied since 1918, when the Dutch introduced the penal code in the country of uh, the, uh, the Queen Guglielmaine. But death penalty was had been abolished, but was applied in the colonies of 
the Netherlands, not in the motherland. So this law has to be reviewed in its political historical context, must be adapted to the development of modern justice. Uh, a law who is unjust is will enter in conflict with moral sense and ethics and morality. So the debate on the death penalty is all about the government maintaining the point that applying death penalty is justified because it is legal. It's legally foreseen by our um, legislation. But this is a colonial heritage that did not absorb the values of Pancasila. The commissions of human rights they identify unjust trials for against people condemned to death, for example, and the lack of minimal conditions like, for example, legal uh, assistance or qualified translators. So the interviews are of poor quality, and um, the poor quality also of the technical assistance and forced um, confessions and eyewitness who are biased, uh, lack of uh, uh, proceedings of um, processes which could lead to the grace uh, to parole. So this process of legal justice is uh, flawed and characterized by discriminations also on the color of the skin nationality. So the myth of the deterrent effect of the death penalty is not uh, some grounded on empirical evidence and uh, it is not really punished by punishing to death a person is not really fair the lay for the indonesian laws for example foresee death penalty for drug trafficking and people think that it will scare people, and people will stop uh, crime. But empirical data do not prove the assumption of, uh, and do not legitimize the death penalty, which just creates fear, but does not reduce crime. Applying death penalty does not reduce at all the volume of drug trafficking in Indonesia. On the contrary, drug trafficking is still high and more sophisticated and more developed. Canada. Canada is the proof that after the abolition of death penalty, the cr uh, criminal rate or the murder rate has plummeted. So human so the law is actually imposing on human humans restrictions of law and order and law becomes um, a monster uh, and police are instrumentalizing the human being and to f allegedly free people from crime by menacing the, 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 the very life of the citizens through death penalty. The idea that death penalty would reduce the crime rate is not demonstrated on the contrary. Therefore, instead of continuing to make the argument that death penalty is legitimate, it is better to strengthen the case, uh, make the case for the abolition of death penalty. Uh, on the other hand, uh, applying death penalty uh, shows that the Indonesian government is finding an effective shortcut to oppose crime without uh, uh, coping with the roots of the problem, which is crime. Government should shift its focus in um, addressing structural issues like poverty and corruption. In terms of international relationships, applying death penalty is not an advantage for the Indonesian state. And the firmness of the president in executing as, uh, foreign residents who are condemned to death can strain diplomatic relationship between countries. Instead, 
an approach of reparative justice should be applied to also support victims to receive a compensation, but trying to understand the causes and the consequences of their behavior by a rehabilitation path and um, struggling to make people responsible and uh, also through their communities to understand the reasons of crime, promoting well-being of the communities, preventing crime, and encouraging mutual consent. So the retributive principle should be improved by the reformative principle. I would like to thank you for the last thing you said. We cannot just have a retributive justice, but we have to introduce uh, rehabilitative justice. Justice not for retribution, but for rehabilitation. Please stay with us. This is the spirit of this meeting of ours. And in this very moment, we are receiving plenty of uh, from Berlin, from Dakar, from Barcelona, but also from Texas and from Huntsville, close to death row in Texas, several dozens of messages of people who feel encouraged by this webinar for a movement for reparative justice, rehabilitative justice. I would like to invite all those who are connected with us now to make use of the hashtag, stand for humanity. Stand for humanity. This is the spirit of this meeting. We can, we can do this together as in the movement of the letters to the, those who are condemned to death, we can, we can stand for one person. But that will make a difference, like for the starfish. And for example, in the United States, the retention estates have reduced to 24. And 23 are those who have abandoned capital punishment, and three are the states that declared a moratorium. Oregon, California, Pennsylvania. This shows that continuing the fight matters. All is useful. Also, a letter can make the difference. Let us listen again Fabrizio Gifuno from Letters. The prison is a savage place. The stronger survive mentally and physically. The weakest fail. What is most important to, to counter every day is mental illness. We try to develop our ways to resist. We have, I have a small piece of soap that authorities provide us to clean our cell. I clean myself more than 30 times a day. I develop the uh, order manaya. I am maniac of order. I can't see something out of place in my cell, but it is an empty cell. When I take a shower, I clean my skin with soap as if I were dirty, but I'm not dirty at all. At times, I spend more than one hour brushing my teeth. Even if I haven't eaten anything, I brush my teeth eight times a day, but here we only eat three times a day and the food is not good. Some mental illness, perhaps, is inside me, but I try to resist. Robert. Robert was condemned to death when he was a young man. Oh, sorry, David Mathis. He was uh, in jail in a prison in Louisiana. And to stay alive, he has agreed to a life sentence. He will tell us what happens to him. One deserves that. While some prisoners are... Good evening to all. My name is David Mathis, and I am 46 years old. And I've been incarcerated since when I was 14. I was first locked at Angola, Louisiana State Penitentiary, facing the death penalty for a murder I had not committed. In fact, presently, 
I am an exoneree. While the death penalty is supposed to be the ultimate punishment for the most egregious crimes, it is used as a political tool to serve some personal agenda by those in power. That is the bottom line, no one will admit. It does not deter crime. It does not solve or resolve any issue with the incident. It only creates job security for lawyers, the judicial system, and politicians who make their living using the death penalty as an abstract motive to retain wealth and power, who consider prisoners as unredeemable, meaning not worth saving, not a person at all. In fact, they consider me a beast. So was told a friend of mine who came to visit me years ago. I became a renowned artist, a published author, mentor to other inmates and teaching inmates anger management, ethics, and substance abuse classes, becoming an asset to the prison and the prison administration. The other sign of that coin are those given life sentences, which are nothing more than prolonged death sentences, which are also used exactly the same and for the same reasons. I have learned not to judge a person by their worst moment of their life. No one deserves that. While some prisoners are difficult people to deal with, they should all be given every chance to prove themselves worthy of redemption and ability to regain their freedom. They must be given the opportunity and tools. They need to be shown how, because no one else has ever taken the time to do so before. We are not animals to be caged, to be put down or warehoused like cattle to make money or careers for the power brokers we elect as politicians. Only a demonic system can claim to administer justice by becoming God on earth, claiming the right to take a life. But God is in heaven. And God says, do not kill. Have you heard? do not kill. Today, from the Colosseum, that was a place of state murder, I encourage you not to give up and stand beside the community of Sant'Egidio for the world moratorium against death penalty. Death penalty is a shame for the humankind. And be all of you a pen pal for prisoners in any corner of the world. I want to express my gratitude for these 17 years of correspondence. Thank you all for making possible to shout out the truth. If anyone wants to be in contact with me, address your request to the community of Sant'Egidio. But the United States from Louisiana. Well, we go to New Orleans. We have a great friend, Sister Helen Prejean. Helen, you're a tremendous friend of us. She, she spoke, she may have spoken to more people in the world than those who have seen the Oscar winning film in which Susan Sarandon lent her art playing her in Dead Man Walking. We fought the UN battles together, collecting millions of signatures. I'm so glad you're here with us, Helen. Helen, though unfortunately, we are speaking today a few months from the end of the Trump presidency that unfortunately was uh, saw an unprecedented trail of state execution in Iowa, in Iowa in the death row, federal death row, after a 20-year moratorium, 13 people were executed more than in all over in the United States, like a, a homicidal frenzy. President Biden instead restored a moratorium 
a federal moratorium, but we believe that a breakthrough is needed. Also from the United States, when 23 states, again 24, do not practice any more death penalty, three declared, as we said, a, a general moratorium of the executions. And from this World Day of Cities for Life, Helen, we want to send an official appeal to President Biden. For the first time, the United States, please vote at the UN General Assembly, yes, to the moratorium resolution. So the US will have the time to continue their pathway towards a justice respectful of the, the human right, which is life. Sister Helen, dear Helen, would it be a great same sign of change? What else could we do? Well, I'm so glad to be a part of this worldwide forum to call attention to there can be no justice without life. If you're not alive, how can you get justice? Uh, there to my left, your right, is uh, from Seoul, South Korea, a, a famous calligrapher asked me my favorite scripture verse. And it's the words of Jesus, I have come that you may have life to the full, not just to be living, but to be fully alive. I will join my voice with that of others to President Biden that when he sends the ambassador to the UN to join our voices of the United States to call for a full moratorium worldwide on the death penalty. Biden is a good president and he has called for a moratorium on the federal death penalty. This right after President, former President Trump killed 13 people in the last six months of his presidency. And it alludes to what many, many people have spoken of as the political dimension that is in the death penalty. And the way the death penalty is set up in the United States, it is totally up to the discretion of prosecutors to seek death or not. From the time of trial, if a prosecutor does not seek the death penalty, no body dies. And all along the way of the appeal system in the state courts, if the state drops, its quest for death, the person does not die. I want to call attention to the role that religion has played or the way people invoke falsely religion or to have God on their side that God authorizes this taking of human life. We have in the United States many people that invoke God it's a form of what they call the following of Christ or Christianity that really believes in violence as a way to solve social problems. And I see that invocation of even quoting the scriptures. I witnessed a DA one time before the group say, as Jesus said, those who live by the sword die by the sword. And so people can, what you call proof text, scripture, pull out a quote, out of context, to serve your own purposes. It has been 1,500 years of dialogue in the Catholic Church for us to reach a point where finally, in August 2018, Pope Francis sealed the teaching of the Catholic Church that under no circumstances, no matter how terrible the crime, we cannot give the state the right to take life. That's been the problem all along. So you have 1,500 years of dialogue in the Catholic Church, and because it goes back to a time when there were no prisons, and the church upheld the right of the state to stop violent offenders, always though, always, for the defense of society. It was never using this rationale as our modern death penalty in the United States does. There are some crimes by the very nature so terrible that the only proximate or proportionate punishment is death. That was never the Catholic Church's teaching. It's always been about defense. The UN article 
Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 3, it's really clear that you cannot ever give the state or governments the right to take life because it states in every human person simply by being a person is an inalienable right to life. So in other words, governments don't give life for good behavior or take life away for bad behavior. It is not within their jurisdiction to deal with taking human life. Article three and then article five follows closely that no human person simply by being a person should be subjected to cruel and degrading punishment or torture. The death penalty is intrinsically torturous because you have conscious imaginative beings put in small cells for 15, 20 years and told on this day, we will kill you. And when you have an imagination, you anticipate dying, you picture dying. And the one nightmare I know of all the people I've accompanied to execution, I've accompanied six, was they're coming for me. It's my time. The guards are dragging me out of my cell. And then I wake up. It's a dream. But they're going to come for me sometime. And not to mention the torture of watching as your fellow prisoners, whom you've gotten to know, maybe had deep friendships with, are paraded in front of your cell as they are taken to the death chamber to be killed. You cannot have an imposed extrinsic death on people by government without torture. The dialogue within the Catholic Church revolved around this essential element of is it being used to defend life or is it basically used as a political means to try to control things or to take life for political purposes. And I wanna share here the direct dialogue that I have. This is indeed the heart of the dialogue that all of us have about the death penalty. It's intrinsic morality is about the dignity of the human person. And no human person should be told they're gonna to die on a certain date and then rendered utterly defenseless and then their life taken by whatever method, if it's gas or shooting or whatever. But it's that deliberate rendering a person defenseless and killing them. And that was the heart of my dialogue with Pope John Paul in 2000 and in 1997. And I got a chance, just as you would if you had a chance, and it's the heart of the dialogue we all have with each other. I said to him, your holiness, when I'm walking with a man to execution, he is strapped down. He, his hands are, are tied. His, he has leg irons on his legs. He's surrounded by six guards. We're getting ready to walk about 35 steps where he's going to be strapped down and killed. And he turns to me and he says, Sister, please pray that God holds up my legs as I make this walk. And I said to Pope John Paul, your holiness, where is the dignity in rendering a human being defenseless and killing them? Don't we have a way to keep society safe without imitating the terrible violence and killing people who have killed others? Pope John Paul was the first one to publicly, in 1999 in St. Louis, he was the first Pope ever to publicly put the death penalty in with what the other what are called pro-life issues for Catholics. And there in St. Louis, he said no to abortion, no to physician-assisted suicide, and no to the death penalty, which is cruel and unnecessary. Even those among us who have done a terrible crime have a dignity that must not be taken from them. He set it up, and then when Pope Francis came, he then sealed it by changing the wording in the Catholic catechism and teaching forever. And we grow in our faith. We grow in our morality. As believers and followers of Jesus, we grow in our understanding. I personally have grown from someone who basically tried to live a life of piety and charity to getting involved with social justice 
and then meeting people on death row and making that then my champion cause that the heart of the gospel of Jesus is the dignity of each human person as a child of God and that no one is unredeemable. No one can be cast as you are so unredeemable. You are the worst of the worst of the worst so that we can justify ourselves that we can kill you. And I want to end by calling attention to the death penalty in Japan, which is one of the cruelest, because when people go to death row in Japan, they never know, no matter how, if they're the last one on the row, it's completely up to the minister of justice to decide who's going to die next. And they all dread at 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a certain guard that comes to the cells and you can be the last one put on the row and then they take you and they take you and hang you, send a letter to your parents two weeks later called in this uh, cruel language, the separation has happened. I want to call attention. There is a Japanese family, the Furukawa family, that I have joined on many occasions in campaigns to end the death penalty in Japan. And they are still working. They are the Furukawas and the mother of the family, Michiko Furukawa, just put her book out. It's on Amazon and it's called, I Cannot Take Off My Straw Sandals. Straw sandals are what the activists for justice as they went on pilgrimage to call attention to. And it's on Amazon and I urge you to get it. We need the witness of Grazie. people who spend their lives Grazie, Ellen. urging Ellen, the death penalty. Permettimi, uh, Ellen, permettimi. Mi Helen, do you hear me? Helen, I want to take your point. Let us not take away the straw sandals. No one has to take away the straw sandals, the sandals of the struggle for life. The young, the youth for peace are now in their flash mob close to the Colosseum and we are receiving continuously messages of people asking for for the webinar will be online yes you will you will you can see the webinar again and you can share with others santegidio.org will be the website let's go now to the Colosseum with the words of Sister Helen, which we cherish in our heart. There is an alignment between the human rights uh, uh, movement and the pathway of the Catholic Church by which every life has to be respected and any all death penalties in human and unacceptable. There is alignment now today, human rights, Catholic Church. We give the floor to the Colosseum now. Here we are again, together spaced apart but united once again we want to enlighten you to light up a dream started together many years ago now we seem to see better on one hand the many victories for our cause because new countries have decided to abolish or suspend the death penalty
beings into beasts. Mondo. The death penalty is like the war of an entire state against an individual. The world is tired of wars, of ethnic clashes. It is tired of mourning the victims of the pandemic. How to do it then? What can we do? We have to look up. We have to look at the sky. This year, we want to dedicate a thought to the many friends who are no longer with us and who have accompanied our journey towards the abolition of the death penalty, like a luminous trail. Friends who have fought and taught us a lot, like Dominique Green, like Dimitri and Tamara Chikonova, like Bill Pelke, and many of them have become bright stars, while the darkness of capital punishment around the world has diminished. This is why tonight, here, and in thousands of cities around the world, we discover a simple truth, that there is never true justice without life. Violence and death are combated only with life. We want more life. It is possible. With your commitment, with Cities for Life, a life made to measure for everyone, without fear, that we should regain strength in the world. With you, together, the future has already begun. was a good idea to be here tonight. The emperors never saw the Colosseum in this way. So beautiful, so human. We have a privilege. We are privileged tonight to be so many everywhere in the world. We must make the most of this. I would like to thank, to thank all those who have worked for this worldwide event. There are many. I would like to thank the web team. Outstanding work. They work for free, as always in Sant'Egidio. And those who covered the Colosseum with these words and messages, I thank the staff, uh, those put their hearts and mind into all this. I thank Fabrizio Gifuni for his civic commitment. And I would like to thank the Ministry of Culture of Italy in the Archaeological Park of Rome. They are in charge of the Colosseum and also the municipal Roma Capitale enterprise. And I thank all those who are connected with us in more than 70 countries around the world. We received plenty of messages. Tonight is easier for all of us to reply to the question of those children asking, if they killed him because he killed the man, then who should we kill next? It is now easier to explain that no one is safe with death penalty and that death penalty can only be fought with life. So the struggle continues. Indeed, it begins. There is no justice without life. Our hashtag Stand for Humanity reminds us of this. We are here with the Colosseum while a great musician which is here in the musician and with his, it's cold here tonight, but with his art and his unforgettable music, the music of Ennio Morricone reminds us of our mission, which continues. The future is now. Stefano Di Battista, thank you.
Um...